welcome to worship. It's nice to see all of you here today. A warm welcome also to those of you who are worshiping with us online here today, too. When you were a little kid, and like little kids do, splashing around in the mud and in the puddles, what did mom or dad make you do before you came into the house? Take off your shoes. Yes, take off your shoes. Don't drag that mud into the house. At the very beginning of our worship services, we, we use the confession of our sins and the absolution of our sins. We, we confess our sins, we lay our muddy sins, our dirtied sins at the foot of the cross of Christ, and in that cross we find forgiveness. We're going to focus on that confession and absolution in our worship today. The service is printed out for you in our service folder, and we'll begin with that opening hymn on page 3. Uh, this hymn reminds us that, that that sinful nature inside of us has been drowned out through the waters of our baptism and that we daily arise refreshed and renewed to live our lives for Christ. Before we start singing that hymn, I'd like you to take a moment to greet those that are going to be worshiping around you today. God bless our worship. Good morning. How are you? of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. God, our heavenly 
Heavenly Father has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. protector of all the faithful, you alone make strong, you alone make holy. Show us your mercy and forgive our sins day by day. Guide us through our earthly lives that we do not lose the things you have prepared for us in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson is taken from the book of 2 Samuel. This will serve as the basis for our sermon later on. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children, it shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You killed him with the sword. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. 
Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had borne to David, and he became ill. This is God's word. We join in singing uh, the hymn, Blessed Are They, Forever Blessed, uh, which reflects the words of our psalm of the day, Psalm 32. We'll sing that hymn together. chapter 2. Jesus says to us in Matthew 18 that if your brother sins against you, you are to go and show him his sin just between the two of you. You're to keep that sin private. However, uh, if someone sins publicly, Scripture tells us that we are to publicly rebuke them lest other people are led astray. We see an example of this in Paul's letter to the Galatians where Paul had to publicly rebuke Peter for Peter's public sin. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. <clears throat> When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth are not Gentile sinners. Know, know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If, while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. This is God's word. We join in singing stanza four of the hymn, Blessed Are They, Forever Blessed. How glorious is that righteousness that hides and cancels all their sins while bright the evidence of grace through all their lives appears and shines. Out of respect for the gospel, please stand. Our Holy Gospel for this Sunday is taken from Luke chapter 7, beginning with the 36th verse. In this account, we see a woman who's so grateful for the free forgiveness that Jesus offered 
that she anoints his feet with a very expensive perfume and, and can't stop kissing his feet out of thanks for the free forgiveness he gives. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume and she stood behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, you, O Christ. You may be seated and the children are invited to come forward for the children's message. Good morning, guys and ladies. How are you? Good. Have a seat. What are some of your favorite games that you guys like to play? We like chess. Chess? Yeah. Nice. Chess, checkers. Well, you guys ever play tag? Yeah. Do you play hide and go seek? Yeah. I love hide and go seek. How do you play hide and go seek? What do you have to do? Someone goes and hides, and somebody goes and tries to find them, right? Yeah. Have you ever, have you ever done something bad, something naughty, and, and you got scared and you went and hid somewhere because you were scared of what mom and dad were going to say? You ever go in your room or close the door, you hide because you're scared of what mom and dad are going to say? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that can be scary when we do something wrong because we feel really bad. We feel really bad for what we do, and we don't want to get in trouble. Um, but, but the answer, when, when we feel bad about what we do, is not to go and hide. It's actually to go and talk to that person that we hurt. If we hurt mom or if we hurt dad, we go and tell them what we did. So that way, when we tell them that we're sorry and, and, and that we know what we did was wrong, they can tell us the most wonderful news of all, and that is that, that our sin is forgiven, that, that, that Jesus paid for that sin. And, and how did Jesus pay for our sins? He died on the cross, and because of that, all my sins. When I'm naughty with mom and dad, all those sins are taken away. And because of that, where do I get to go someday? Heaven. Heaven. Very good. Okay, let's fold our hands, and let's thank Jesus for the free forgiveness he gives us, okay? Dear Jesus, thank you so much for dying on the cross and paying for all my sins. Help me always to never hide from them, but to confess my sins and tell mom and dad, when I've done wrong, so I can hear the good news that they love me and that all my sins are forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys, for coming up here. Good answers today. We'll continue our worship service uh, with our hymn of the day, Chief of Sinners Though I Be. And you guys can go sit down or you can go back to Kids Church. And uh, we'll continue with that. Oh, 
grace, his mercy, and peace be yours in abundance through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The words for our consideration today are taken from our first lesson from 2 Samuel. Please allow me just to read one of those verses again. <coughs> then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. This is God's word. Please bow your heads for prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in the old days of wooden ships, it wasn't uncommon for some passengers to sneak aboard and hitch a free ride. These passengers were about mm, yay big, furry, long tails, beady black eyes, and of, of course talking about rats. Ugh. Many people might have been unaware that there were rats aboard the ship, creeping and crawling, exploring through every nook and cranny, every part of every corner of that vessel. However, people quickly became aware of their furry friends below if that ship were about to sink. Sensing that danger was coming upon them, the rats would scrape and claw and creep through any corner, any hole they could find through that wood to try and get to the top of the boat so that way they didn't plunge into the freezing, frigid waters below. They do anything to escape that, that drowning. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. I'm not the one that you're looking for. When God's law shines on us, our sinful nature shrieks at that. We try and and plead a case in our own defense. I, it wasn't me. I, I'm not the one that you're looking for. I didn't do that. I didn't do anything wrong. Our sinful nature hates to be, to be exposed, for sin to be open, out as plain as day. Like that rat trying to escape from a drowning ship, a sinking ship, my sinful nature will do horrible things in order to keep my sin secret. It'll lie. It'll cheat, it'll steal, it'll scratch, it'll claw, it'll do anything to keep that sin covered and hidden. We see an example of that in the life of King David in our lesson for today. The, the nation of Israel was actually really prosperous under David's reign. God was, was, was blessing them tremendously. They, they, they had won some wonderful battles, some victories. Uh, in fact, they were battling the Ammonites and they would take siege of the city of Rabbah. Well, while they were at war, Scripture tells us that one night, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. As we look at this sad account from King David's life, I want you to pay very special close attention to this. I want you to notice how each sin piles on top of each other. 
sin, sin doesn't just stop, but it, it continues to, he, he scraped and he clawed to try and keep these sins a secret. He's walking around on top of the roof. Now maybe he knew what he was going to see. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. But he's walking around and, and he sees Bathsheba bathing and instead of going back to his room, averting his eyes, he stayed up there. His heart wandered from the Lord. He looked and, and he lusted after her. But it didn't stop there. He gathers together some of his, his servants and he, he starts poking around, asking questions. Who, who is that girl? What's, what's her story? What's her name? He coveted. Then he asked some of his servants, go get her for me. Bring her to me. Didn't stop there. He slept with her, committed adultery. When she discovers that she's pregnant and lets him know this, he tries to bring her husband Uriah home from the, the, the army front lines, hoping that maybe this would cover up the lie, that this would keep his sin a secret. But when that didn't work, he decided he was going to commit murder. He sent Uriah himself with his death note, the, 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 the orders that Uriah was supposed to go to the front lines of the fighting, where the fighting was fiercest. And when they were fighting, the other troops were to withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. David might have not been the one who jabbed the sword into Uriah's chest, but he certainly murdered him. Do you see how his sins snowballed? He, he lusted, he coveted, he committed adultery, he, he lied, he murdered, he lied again. He just kept building and building and building and building. His sinful nature would stop at nothing to try and keep this all a secret, to try and keep this hidden and covered from everybody else. Because really, on the surface of it all, to, to someone who didn't really know any better, David looked like a pretty nice king pretty good guy for what he was doing. After all, taking in the grieving widow of a fallen soldier and making her your wife, wow, that David, he's, a, he's something else. What a nice guy. He thought no one else knew what was going on. He thought that he could keep his sin a secret, but, but God knew. God knew the truth. And so the Lord sent the prophet Nathan to go and talk to David about this sin. And when Nathan comes to him, he, he doesn't outright call him out on his sin, but he tells him a story to try and help him understand his sin. And he says, there's this rich guy and there's this poor guy. The rich guy, he's got everything. He's got land, he's got cattle, he's got wealth. You name it, it's his. Got it all. And there's this poor guy. He's just got one little lamb. That's it. Nothing else to him. Well, anyway, this, this guest, this visitor, he comes by to town, calls in on, the, on this rich man, and the rich man, instead of taking from his, his, his bountiful stock of cattle, lambs, goats, sheep, whatever, he goes and steals this one little lamb, this one sole little lamb of this poor man. And did you hear how David reacted when he heard this news? I, I, David thought this story was real. What did David say? He burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. With his cheeks burning and the vein popping out of his forehead and his neck cord swelling, David pronounces a just judgment on this man. He deserves to die for doing such a thing. And with pinpoint precision... Nathan hits David square between the eyes. You are the man, David. You're that rich man. You're the one who did this. You're the one who stole a fellow soldier's wife. You're the one who, who betrayed a fellow countryman and had him killed. You're the one who lied to try and keep this sin a secret. You're the one. You are the man. Maybe there was a place that was, maybe it was your tree house. Maybe it was underneath the kitchen sink. Maybe it was underneath your bed or in your closet or up in the attic. But you probably had a place when you were a little kid that when you did something naughty, you went to your fortress of solitude. A place where you, you went and hid because 
you knew that it was almost five o'clock and dad was coming home pretty soon? Your father was about to deal with you? Did that take the fear away? Did that, did that by hiding, did that take that guilt of sin away? Did it, did it make it leave you, but not bother you anymore? I, no. We, we can't run from our problems. We can't escape them. We can't escape our sins, no matter how, how far we try to run, no matter what we try to do to cover it up. We, we can't find it at the bottom of a bottle. We can't numb the pain through a needle. We can't get away from it. That, that guilt stays with us. It, it, it gnaws at our conscience and at our hearts. You probably have felt that way before. David talks about that time, this time in his life when he was trying to cover up that sin. He writes about that in Psalm 32. He said, listen to how David felt at this time when he was trying to keep this, this, hit, this sin hidden. He says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. David was sick to his stomach when he thought about what he had done. And this guilt just pulled on his heart and on his soul. We felt that way before. When we think about, man, how sweet Satan's invitation sounded at the, Satan's invitation sounded at the time. That you don't know what you're missing. You don't know how much fun this is going to be. No one will ever know. This will just be our little secret. And how, how quickly those, those delightful invitations quickly became the accuser's ammunition. After we fell for the trap, when all of a sudden he starts pointing the finger back at us, and says, how could you do such a thing? Who could ever forgive you? You have to keep this a secret. You can't let anybody find out about this. I hope that you never feel that there's something that you need to keep hidden from your God or, or, or from anyone else. That, that there's something so great that you can't ever be forgiven. Because that's just not true. Our God promises, he assures us that he forgives us all of our sins. Ask yourself the question, why, why did Nathan go to David that day? What was his motivation? Was it to, to celebrate in David's sin? All right, David, good one. That was fun, I bet. No. But was it to make himself feel better? I thought I was bad. But David, adultery, murder, lying? Whew, you take the cake. I thank thee, Lord, that I'm not like David. No. He went there because he was sent by God and out of love for his brother and his king. He went there to to do something that he knew was going to crush David, that he knew something that was going to pierce him, to preach the law to him, to help him understand and help him confess this sin, to get rid of that guilt. And by God's grace, the Holy Spirit worked through that law, worked through Nathan's words. And upon hearing those words, those horrendous words that must have crushed David, you are the man. David admits his guilt. There is no other rock to crawl under. There is no other lying. Nothing else he could do to keep this sin covered. Naked and ashamed, he admitted, I have sinned against the Lord. And notice that Nathan didn't make him jump through any hoops. He didn't put any conditions. He didn't say, I don't believe you. I don't believe that you're really sorry. You've got to prove to me that you're really sorry. He said, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. Quickly, freely, he assured David, God has taken away your sin. We all have our secret sins, don't we? Sins from our past. Skeletons in our closet. Memories that... We, we wish we could erase moments that we wish we could take back. But life doesn't really come with a do-over button, does it? Can't do that. It doesn't work that way. However, 
God promises us. He assures us that when we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just. That he forgives those sins and wipes them clean away. That he grants us that free forgiveness through the blood of the Lamb of God, the Lamb which he sent to shed his blood for us, our Savior Jesus. That Jesus' death on the cross was what, is what saves us. It's what forgives our sins. That as Isaiah remarks, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Let go of that baggage. Let go of that guilt that you've been heaving around this week, maybe this year, maybe for the past 20 years. Let it go. That sin has been forgiven. That sin has been paid for by Christ. There isn't an ounce that your heart needs to bear. There isn't a single stain on your slate. You've been washed clean through the blood of the Lamb. Are we the ones? Are we the ones who are guilty of sin? Absolutely. We confess our sin, we admit our sin before God. Yes, I have sinned against the Lord. But God assures you my brothers and sisters in Christ, that the Lord has taken away your sin, that you're the ones who know of the free forgiveness that's yours. You're the ones who know that Jesus paid for those sins in full. You're the ones who know that death isn't the end, that you'll live forever. Take comfort in that fact, that you can let that baggage go. Take comfort that as G in Jesus' invitation, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Find forgiveness in him. Find forgiveness in your Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and praise and honor forever and ever. Amen. In the peace of that forgiveness, we join in singing the fifth stanza of hymn 385. Confessing that faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed, which is found on pages 11 and 12 in your worship folder. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. 
At this time, our ushers are going to be handing out our friendship registers. We ask that you please sign those and mark your visit with us. Also, those of you who are worshiping with us online, please be sure to sign the, uh, the online guest registry as well. After that, we have the opportunity to thank our Heavenly Father for the free forgiveness which he gives us through the blood of his Son. stand for prayer. In our prayers for today, we will be thanking God for the gift of our, our earthly fathers. Uh, we'll also be thanking God on behalf of John and Dory Collins, who uh, welcome to their family, a daughter, Macy. Uh, we'll also be praying for Meredith and Josh Robbie, who today are celebrating their one-year anniversary, and Josh and so Shauna Ranft, who are celebrating their 10-year anniversary. Uh, we'll keep in our prayers uh, our brothers and sisters over at Gethsemane in Raleigh. Pastor Gunther accepted his call to Grace in Kenai, Alaska, uh, and so uh, we will certainly be praying for him as he continues his ministry up in Alaska, but also for uh, our brothers and sisters at Gethsemane as they continue this time with as a vacancy. And we'll also be praying for those who are traveling today uh, and now during this summer season, as well as Van Johnson and his family, who are friends of Keith Johnson. Uh, Van is Keith's manager at work, and, and Van lost his mother uh, to brain and kidney cancer yesterday morning. Uh, when hearing the news, his father collapsed, and now he's in the hospital too. So we'll be praying for the, the Johnson family as well. We take our request to the Lord. Lord of power and grace, whose eyes are on the righteous and whose ears are open to their cry, hear the prayer of your people as we come now in thankfulness for the mercies that you pour down on us anew each and every single day. Heavenly Father, bless all earthly fathers as they seek to fulfill the calling that you've entrusted to them. Give them loving hearts and sound judgment to exercise godly family leadership. May they daily take to heart your admonition not to discourage their children by treating them harshly or unfairly, but to help them bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In loving Christian fathers, may children see a reflection of you, the Father whose love for us is perfect and complete. Heavenly Father, God of grace, we praise and thank you this day on behalf of our brother and sister, John and Dory Collins, as they welcome to their new family, a daughter, Macy. We praise and thank you for the wonderful gift of holy baptism into which Macy will be welcomed into your kingdom uh, as a beloved child. We ask that you be with John and Dory as they raise Macy in the faith and bring her up in the instruction of the Lord. Uh, allow Macy to grow strong in the faith uh, and stay on the, the road of righteousness. Heavenly Father, we also offer a prayer of thanks on behalf of our brothers and sisters, Josh and Meredith Robbie, and Josh and Shauna Ramp, who are celebrating their wedding anniversaries. Thank you, Lord, for the, the wonderful blessings which you've given to them in their marriage. Allow them to continue to grow strong together in the true faith as they, as they grow ever closer with one another and with you. 
God of grace, we praise and thank you for the ministry of Pastor Rob Gunther over at Gethsemane in Raleigh. Uh, we ask that you would continue to be with him as he and his family move to Kenai, Alaska, and, and serve your people up there and serve you there. We ask that you be with our brothers and sisters at Gethsemane who will be uh, during this time with, without a pa full-time pastor. We ask that you watch over them and comfort them, and if it be your will, Lord, grant them a new shepherd soon. Heavenly Father, God of grace, we also ask that your loving hand be with all those who are traveling during these summer months. Watch over especially those members of our congregation who are traveling and seeing family and friends and bring them safely back to us. Heavenly Father, Holy Physician, author of life and death, in your wisdom and, and uh, it, according to your love, you have taken Van Johnson's mother to be, uh, to be home with you. We ask that you would continue to comfort Van and the rest of his family with the good news of the gospel and also be with Van and his family as they comfort his father who's in the hospital as well. Be with Van and, and his family as they uh, aid his father. Be with the doctors and nurses who will be continuing to offer their care and allow Van's father to, to uh, heal quickly and recover speedily. Heavenly Father, use this this tragedy in their lives to bring people closer to you, that people might realize the, the wondrous love and the free forgiveness offered in your Son, who's in, in, it's in his name that we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our God is so generous, and he comes to us with forgiveness in very tangible means as we participate in Holy Communion. Because the Bible has convinced us that Jesus' body and blood are truly present in the Lord's Supper, and that receiving the sacrament together is a public statement of complete oneness in our beliefs, we now invite to the Lord's Supper members of this congregation and other wells and ELS churches. Our congregation doesn't want to be presumptuous and put you in the position of stating your agreement with our convictions before we have had an opportunity to explain them. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Oh, no. 
seated and come forward at the direction of our ushers. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given and shed on the cross for the remission of all your sins. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace and enjoy. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given and shed on the cross for the remission of all of your sins. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Go in peace and enjoy. Your sins are forgiven. is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given and shed on the cross for the remission of all of your sins. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace and enjoy. Your sins are forgiven. Amen.
please stand for the hymn of thanksgiving found on page 15 in your worship folder. keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 Please remain standing for the singing of our closing hymn. Once again, so nice to see all of you today. A warm welcome to our guests and visitors that are here with us today. Glad that you could make it. Uh, happy Father's Day, uh, and, and I hope your Father's Day celebrations go wonderful today. Uh, a couple things that I just wanted to point out in the bulletin, as I mentioned in the prayer, Pastor Gunther accepted that call to Alaska, and so um, he, his last Sunday at Gethsemane will be July 11th. Um, I have been called to serve as the vacancy pastor at Gethsemane, and I've accepted that call. So that means that I'm going to be serving both Tree of Life and Gethsemane during the time of his vacancy. Uh, this could last anywhere from two months to sometimes I've heard 18 months. So it uh, depends on when they get a pastor. Uh,